Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, it's Michael Kilpatrick here, and I have an amazing guest today to share with you. Nicole Masters is an independent agricologist, storyteller, systems thinker, and educator. She is recognized as a knowledgeable and dynamic speaker on the topic of soil health. Her team of soil coaches at Integrity Soils work alongside producers in the U.S., Canada, and across I guess that's Australasia. Supporting- Australasia. Australasia. Okay, there we go. New word for you. Yeah, so that's Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> oh, is that how you combine the two? All right, very mm-hmm. cool. All right, so she supports producers who work on over 1.1 million acres to take their operations to the next level in nutrient density, profitability, and environmental outcomes. Her book titled For the Love of Soil showcases examples of the tools and principles producers are using to regenerate the soils, describing a step-by-step triage of action so that you too can regenerate your land. Um, Her website is Integrity Soils. Dot co dot nz. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Michael. It's great. Yeah, I uh, you know I just got done reading your book about a week or ten days ago, and I want to tell you it was one of the uh, you know every soil book I read, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the best. But oh. seriously, I love yours because not only do you talk about some really uh, new and innovative things, and uh, I learned so much from it, but you also share share some great stories. And I think that's what really brings out that I loved about the book is it just shared these exact case studies of how you did different things on farms, um, which was, was really good. Yeah. And I think as people, we all learn better through stories. And, and that's, that was part of the drive for the book was, you know, let's tell some, let's tell the stories of people that are, that are really doing some extraordinary stuff. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you get obsessed with soil? Oh. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I don't even remember how I fell into it at university, but I ended up doing some soil science papers and just mm-hmm. thinking, you know, this this is really, really fascinating and got really excited by it. And that's what I ended up majoring in. Um, but actually, it wasn't until 2002 when I saw Elaine Ingham speak and she talked about soils being alive. And just mm-hmm. for me, the, the, the light bulbs went on because I'd found soil really exciting before I realized it was alive. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. And and I guess when it when it comes down to it, everything that we are concerned about comes back to soil. If that's uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere or um, human nutrition or water quality or land management, it all comes back to soil. So for me, it's it's something that I've never got tired of and, and there's always something new to learn. Uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then what year did you actually start to take it to the business level? Well, in 1999, I was managing community gardens, and that was mm-hmm. just kind of something I'd fallen into finishing university and, and um, yeah, just did some work. And then um, I moved back to my father's farm in 2000 and started to do large-scale composting and vermiculture, so worm composting. And um, I taught my first class in 2003 to a bunch of avocado growers about mycorrhizae and Mm -hmm. the role of fungi and um, realized about then that actually there was a whole world to be explored. So, um, you know, selling vermicast and compost um, wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of people doing or even selling worms. So I got got some work doing um, household uh, waste mm-hmm. reductions and selling worms to those to those programs. So, yeah, I started I think in my own business in 2002. So my son at the time was one, and I just couldn't find work as a single parent at the mm. time. And um, yeah, the the soil thing just kind of kept evolving. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So first, let's kind of lay the groundwork and sh- and talk about the problem we find ourselves in as a world. You know, you mentioned mm. in, that some of the fertilizers we used in the 50s are just now finding their way into the water streams and the waterways. Mm. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that and just the, you know, where where are we today, 2020, you know, we're recording this. Mm. Yeah. It's very fascinating. It's like we've been on this 100-year chemical experiment and... Mm-hmm. Uh, 
people are really waking up to, well, what is that impact of that chemical in my body or in the environment um, or in my children or my children's children? And there's a lot more work coming out around epigenetics mm -hmm. and the impact of, say, you know, drinking water out of plastic bottles with um, that are releasing PBAs and all sorts mm -hmm. of things is changing your child's like so every generation of of children or male children are being born with half the sperm rate of their fathers oh um, wow which is you know those kind of terrifying statistics and mm -hmm. and certainly as i started to delve into and, and do more research on on the book and thinking about how, what are we doing with food for instance how are, how are we changing the epigenetic profile of of our own children and our children's children through this chemical experiment. And, and a lot of the results now are coming to the forefront. Why are we dealing uh -huh. with so many human health issues and um, you know learning difficulties and all sorts of things that society's facing. And it's like um, the, the risk assessment isn't possible to do on all the different chemicals that, I mean, there's a new chemical invented every three seconds. There's another oh. chemical that's uh -huh. just being out on the market and we don't know what these things do. And um, if we think about, nitrogen fertilizers that were applied in the 50s like you were saying you uh -huh. know they're now coming out into the waterways now causing algal blooms and eutrophication and it's like those things become very hard to scramble back from and uh -huh. and so uh, for me a big emphasis is, is thinking about what are the unintended consequences of many of the actions that we're doing on land and how can we really start to align with nature so we don't get these un unintended consequences and we're not dealing with a situation with your great grandkids for instance so it's something that mm -hmm. i'm quite passionate about and it's like a lot of what we are t told that we have to use in agriculture is actually a fallacy you know we mm -hmm. don't need to be putting all these chemicals on we don't need to be using all the fertilizers um, and that's certainly the the case for for the people i talk about in the book Mm -hmm. You know, one thing you mentioned, I think I uh, bring it up later, but you talk about the phosphorus is just super high levels of phosphorus um, mm. ca can can be contributed to higher rates of cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that phosphorus does in the body is it causes cell replication. Um, and so the work hasn't been done in New Zealand. There's certainly um, research papers that look if you feed um, rats on a high phosphorus diet that they end up developing um, lung and skin cancers. Uh -huh. And New Zealand has the highest cancer rate in the world, which, you know, people might hear that and be quite shocked. And uh -huh. even if, if you take melanoma out, so skin cancers, because New Zealand doesn't have an ozone layer down there, uh, we're still number three. So wow. New Zealand has this really, really high level of, of cancers. And we also have the highest level of phosphorus in our food of, of any, any place in the world, except Singapore. So New Zealand uses more phosphorus um, per acre of land than, than anywhere else. And there's a, there's a consequence to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. And why do they use so much? Is it just because what they've been told? It's because of what they were told. Um, and certainly in the 1950s and 60s, there was a government program to break in that land. So New Zealand is the youngest country, youngest agricultural country mm -hmm. too. Um, and so when they arrived, New Zealand was never a grassland. We never had mammals, for instance. So um, we only had two bats. So the rest of the, the wildlife were birds. And so to break that land in as such to turn it into the agricultural grazing land. There was a lot of scrub and forest and that all needed to be removed. And then you've got a soil situation that's very different from mm -hmm. what it is that a grass requires. So how they got that grass to grow was they poured phosphorus on and the government actually uh, subsidized that to happen. And so what's, what New Zealanders have been left with is to grow grass, you have to put phosphorus on. But mm. we're talking about a totally different microbial population and a totally different um, soil carbon profile. Like New Zealand soils were very different from, mm -hmm. say, American soils. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually they're probably more like Vermont soils. If you okay. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I'm familiar with those. Yes. <laughs> from up yeah. there. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of farmers want to be told the answer. And I know you talk about there being just not one answer because everything's so different. Yeah. And everything's so complex. And I think it's it's what, one, we've been trained to do from very young um, is to look for the answer and for things to be really simple. And, and if we're looking for that kind of fix, then we're going to get given the answer, which is going to be, you're going to have to put on this type of fertilizer and these types of pesticides and now this type of fungicide um, instead of really looking at 
what is unique about your your land what is unique about yourself um and so every i find every case has nuances because people are different and and yeah soil situations are different and climate is different and the animals you want to run might be different or the stocking rates or whatever mm -hmm. um and i think yeah it's almost this tendency to want to seek the answer instead of realizing actually the answer is observe take note um be with your land really think about how things operate differently through the season i mean there's so much complexity to agriculture which is what makes it really exciting mm -hmm. um, and i think a lot of the problems that we've got into in agriculture is because we were seeking the answer mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how would you classify soil health because i think that's very ubiquitous too yeah yeah it is um, for me, soil health is a, is a soil that's vibrantly alive, um, that can support, um, you know, biodiversity below and above ground, that has clean water, that is a net sink for greenhouse gases, um, that really is something that supports life. It is the life support system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, looking for, you know, for me in a lot of landscapes, do we have that beautiful aggregate crumb structure? Are we building... Um, you know, more soil carbon or water holding capacity, all of that kind of picture. And even, you know, I, I work a lot in some of these semi-arid, even high desert environments. And it's, um, you know, what does soil health look like there compared to what does soil health look like in New Zealand? So visually that can look very, mm. very different. Yeah. But it's in, in this ecosystem, is it functioning to its full, full potential? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, later in the book, you talk a lot about the plant health pest connection. Can you mm. dive into that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, everything for me is an indicator. So what is happening with um, weeds? What is happening with pests? Uh, and they're not just a given. They are actually there to, to indicate something to you about um, animal, oh, you know, plant health in this case, or soil health. And so insects won't just attack every single plant they are seeking plants that have um, specific disruptions so mm. disruptions in terms of not being able to form what we call these complex um, proteins or complex amino acids so you end up with free amino acids in the in the plant because the plant is um, is dysfunctional for some reason you know the microbiology mm -hmm. maybe not working as well as it could but basically it changes how those um, nitrogen forms are complexed in the plant and it sends a signal to insects to come and clean it up mm -hmm. um, and so we're seeing the rise of uh, broad scale pest attacks um, like what was happening in south africa Mm -hmm. over this winter where you see absolute plagues of locusts coming in um, because those ecosystems are disrupted because there's something um, yeah those plants are under stress and they're like cool all right we'll come and clean that up for you um, so yeah. they're there to provide a really important role but people um, you know there's this tendency to reach for a pesticide instead of looking at okay what what plants maybe are they attacking and is it is it the whole field or is it just the mm -hmm. is it just this edge or is it just you know here or what happened here and and getting really curious about where you see the patterns of insect attack mm -hmm. um so that we can really move away from the pesticides because they certainly are ones that are causing a lot of problems in the ecosystem yeah i know like when we do uh broad acre squash production the winter squash production they always talk about putting the hubbard squashes on the edge because for some reason that the insects like to attack them more than they do their other squash. Mm -hmm. And so that always comes back to me is like, say, is the Hubbard squash not as just genetically as healthy of a plant? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that always has yep. been fascinating to me. Yeah. And, you know, often we grow plants where they might be slightly out of season or it's in conditions where maybe it's too hot or too cold. And, mm -hmm. and we, we are climactically stressing those plants and expecting them, oh, you know, I want to be able to grow broccoli in the middle of summer. And then so, mm -hmm. well, you know, good luck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's but not yeah. quite meant to be done. <laughs> not quite. But yeah, yes. we want to be able to do everything. Yeah. 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 Well, one thing you talk about, and you mentioned in the story about River Sun, is mm. the repeated asking of why. Mm. Um, yeah, dive into that. Yeah. So River Sun Nurseries, um, I absolutely love working with them. They are New Zealand's largest rootstock nursery. They do up to 
five million rootstock a year for viticulture. They're also doing uh, kiwifruit and avocados. And um, one of the practices that they were doing was they would lay, so they'd make furrows in the soil to, mm -hmm. to plant the, the rootstock into, and then they would cover it with um, a black plastic. And that black plastic was to, you know, suppress weeds. Then they would have to run irrigation tape underneath that plastic because now they need to get water in there, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then that's nice and warm and it heats the soil up quickly, um, which is great, but then it gets too hot. So then they have to paint it. Um, <laughs> and then yeah. at, the, at the end of the season, they've got all this massive plastic waste and the irrigation tape waste that they need to dispose of. And so when I arrived there, um, we went through this process of why, you know, why, mm -hmm. why are you doing this? Well, we need to make the soil warm. We need to suppress um, weeds. Well, we need to, you know, make sure we've got irrigation. And so we took those steps back and went, okay, well, what would it look like um, if we use something else to suppress weeds? So um, in that case, they rolled out uh, small barley bales, mm -hmm. like barley mm -hmm. straw bales and used that for weed suppression. Um, and then found, well, you don't need the tape anymore. And so they costed the whole thing out. They looked at labor, um, they looked at time, they looked at all the different inputs and the costs of everything and then disposal and went, well, it saves them an absolute fortune by actually rolling out a barley straw, which is then contributing to soil health and providing mm -hmm. a mulch and all the rest of it. So dollar for dollar, it made much more sense to do something that was much more eco-friendly, but they just got into that zone of this is what we do. And we've mm -hmm. always done it this way. And this is how this is done, you know, across the world, um, mm -hmm. instead of asking those questions for them themselves. So it was a lot of fun and, and they are an enterprise that really does ask those why questions. So mm -hmm. I recommend you ask that why question question at least six times you know really get to the bottom of it and if it comes back to well that's what granddad did mm -hmm. then you need to re, re rethink what that practice was that, that you've just been doing because it actually it has the potential to save a lot of money um, and and maybe transform what your operation is doing now i got an update from riverside and i i hear now they're actually moving into a geotextile fiber so mm -hmm. they're, they're continuing to ask the question but um yeah, looking at something that might be uh, easier for them to manage than the, the barley straw. Yeah, we actually were doing small square bales for a straw and we switched to the big round ones. And so we bought a English um, bale chopper. And so that went yeah. in the back three point, we just would blow it out over the fields. Yes. Um, and that worked out quite well. And it always, you know, we always ran those numbers of, okay, it's how many hours on the tractor to blow this yes. out. But yep. then you you do on the other side of how many hours of weeding are you saving? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the soil, I mean, just the soil after our squash crops was just such a beautiful soil because of all that organic matter being inputted. Yeah. And so if you, and, and, and just, so the overall costing out meant you were saving vast amounts of money. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's something that most people don't do enough of or don't consider all of that. Like what's your labor? What's the fuel? You know, all of the whole picture. So you can mm -hmm. sit back and go, well, actually it's costing me. There's so many aspects on, um, on people's operations that it's costing them money and they're, they're propping it up with other parts of the business without going, Oh, actually yeah. <laughs> this, this needs to go. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think that not looking at the holistic business, just looking at a very specific part, not seeing the interconnecting points. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned enabling factors too, when you talk about Steve in chapter three. Do you want to unpack what you mean by enabling factors? So enabling factors, um, or on the flip side, could also be seen as limiting factors. So what are the aspects, where is the triage or the critical factors that are going to enable uh, plants to grow optimally or stop them growing. So mm -hmm. we look at, well, what is the first most important enabling factor? Well, number one, it's the sun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the sun goes out, obviously we're in a whole lot of trouble, but um, the sun. And then the next thing is, well, what, what else would be critical? If it stopped, nothing else would work. And that would be air. Um, mm -hmm. So it's the same in the soil as it is in our body. And so then the next thing would be water. Um, so thinking about those, those enabling factors in terms of what is it that really slows optimal production um, growth and health in an ecosystem, and then using that to determine where do we take action. And what I've found is on most operations globally, um, air is not moving into the system. People have major problems with compaction um, mm -hmm. through what they've been doing historically with, with management. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, something that just popped in my head, if you could pick, would you rather have unlimited clean water or would you rather have like a, not, I don't say you can't have a perfect soil, but like a really, really high quality, maybe like sandy loam soil to work with. Compared to clean water. Yeah. So let's say you had like maybe a really challenging, stony, more clayish soil or versus mm -hmm. compared to a really nice soil versus yep. unlimited water. Hmm. Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I, I guess it would depend what environment I was in. Um, um, and probably what you're growing, I guess, too. What, and probably what, crops. what I'm growing. Yeah, yeah, really tricky. And someone uh, recently kind of flipped uh, my perception of water on, on my head a little bit by stating that all you need is six inches of water like you can grow anything on six inches of water and I was like wow okay <laughs> and you know and seeing what he's he's achieving and going okay all right well maybe that's uh, maybe that could be a truth um, okay so when yeah. you say six inches of water <laughs> is that because if you have the, the soil done if you have your soil managed well it will just hold all that water for you that's right that's right uh -huh. yeah so so what's happening on most people's properties is because air isn't moving, then water isn't moving in either. And so people think, oh, you know, we've just had an inch of rain. And it's like, no, you didn't. You've maybe mm. got like one millimeter maybe has gone in and the rest has evaporated. So we've created these soils across across the planet that, that go from flash flood to drought, flash flood to drought, because mm -hmm. they're compacted. And so water is actually not the limiting factor that we think it is in a lot of environments. It's soil not having that airspace and the porosity to, to, to draw water in. Um, I guess, you know, you can turn a lot of soils around and, you know, water is certainly going to help speed it up. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very tricky question. I don't know if I'd have a really clear answer on that. On that. I need to totally see the whole fine. picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's more one of those, hmm, what would you do? Hmm, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it, I don't necessarily feel like a lot of, I think we we irrigate a lot of places we don't necessarily need to irrigate and we're wasting a lot of water. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. certainly having a soil that's functional. Now, you also talk about the six different livestock classes in a soil. Mm -hmm. um, and I had never heard someone like break it down like you had. Talk to us why that matters. <laughs> um, I think it, it's important to understand your underground livestock like it is to understand your above ground livestock. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I met this guy once and he was like, you got livestock, you got dead stock. And it's, <laughs> it's always kind of stuck with me in terms of, you know, we really need to understand what that underground livestock is and how they require, you know, different management techniques and, and require different feeding or different watering, just like, you know, a cow or a horse would. Um, mm -hmm. So understanding, you know, I, I mean, I could talk about understanding viruses, but I think we, we actually have very, very, very little understanding of viruses, even though they are the most common organism on the planet, mm -hmm. the most common organism in soil. Um, I mean, right now, obviously, we're all panicking about mm -hmm. COVID and we understand so little about viruses. But anyway, so mm -hmm. also, um, but one thing we do know is they... If you take out all the other predation in the soil ecosystem, viruses is the number one cause of death for bacteria. So they, they, they control um, the bacterial life cycle. Otherwise, bacteria would live forever. Like they just wouldn't die. Okay. So it's viruses that kind of keep that population down. So they're very important in terms of nutrient and water cycling is mm -hmm. that death and decay of, of bacteria. Um, yeah, and then I talk about some you say yep. in China that you know uh, organic uh, soils have four to five time uh, four to five fold increase in vi in uh, the viruses. Yeah, yeah. So where we see soils that are very functional and very healthy, there's a huge amount of virus in there. You know, and the research that's coming out in terms of horizontal gene transfer and evolution and cell um, genetics is is viruses have a very important role in gene expression and a very important role um, in making us who we are. You mm -hmm. know, part of evolutionary theory potentially is that viruses had a big role in this and have basically, you know, learned to farm us, I guess, <laughs> in mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and I, I mean, I'd like to understand more about viruses and you get into the research and everyone's like, there's so much more work that needs to be done. We just, we don't understand. Um, yeah. 
anyway so it's quite it's quite fun and that's the fun stuff about soil is there's so much of it is like oh we still don't really understand we're just scratching on the surface mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. and then you've got the bacteria and that's the mm. next level yeah 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 so you know inc incredibly important in terms of decomposition i mean if we didn't have bacteria i mean the whole planet would just become pretty overwhelmed and you know in our own bodies we have you know, three pounds of bacteria in our gut system and how important they are for, you know, hormones and um, well-being. I mean, they've just developed a vaccine that's made of a soil bacteria for mm -hmm. PTSD for human health, right? Oh, wow. Um, which is really cool. And so they're looking yeah. at giving it to first responders, um, you know, ambulance uh, in, um, in the military to ha actually help people deal with trauma. Um, but there's, you know, different types of bacteria that forming really important um, roles in soil, um, you know, they're what helps to form rain clouds, what forms frost um, is actually types of bacteria, um, is what, uh, you know, the, the plant is intimately communicating with all the time about nutrients, about water, about hormones, um, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, I mean, bacteria, you know, they're the you know, the smallest single celled organisms on the planet. And then uh, the next ones up are your fungi, and then I get into, you know, your protozoa and our micro arthropods, the insects, um, mm. and talk about all these, the different, the different livestock and soil, basically, and, and why they're so important. Well, and the thing is, when you're managing your soil well, you're letting those all work in harmony with each other, and that That's is right. only helping your soil work better. That's right. That's right. And then, and then your soil is working for you instead of you working for it. Mm -hmm. So how do we um, support the optimal livestock so that we can step back and, and enable the plant to be communicating with the microbiology and the microbiology be communicating with the plant and just get out of the way? I mean, a lot of the issues we're dealing with are just because humans keep fiddling. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if we just supported that soil ecosystem, you know, yeah. get out of the way. Because you talk about how a lot of the um, the sugars that a plant takes in is actually going to feed the soil. Yeah, so plants are photosynthesizing, collecting that sugar, and then exuding different types of exudates. So there'll be um, you know fatty acids, amino acids, um, different types of hormones, um, as well as those sugars. So they're sending out just this you know this gorgeous. Uh, myriad of foods basically to signal to different types of microbes um basically farming that system <laughs> to yeah. say hey i need this i need that i'm under stress can you provide this um and yeah so that the plant the plant really is pumping that system all the time mm -hmm. now some people say that like when you have your soil all you need to do is just kind of let the soil be healthy and your healthy soil will provide all the nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other hand, I hear people say, well, that's great, but you've got to get your soil into that good condition first. Where do you, that's wh right. what do you believe? Yeah. So when I first heard that message, um, we pulled our whole fertilizer program, which um, had been happening on the farm and went into compost teas and uh, production crashed. Uh, we had massive animal health problems. We lost some very expensive livestock and um, the light kind of went on for me like, uh, it's not all, not all what you need is biology. I mean, mm -hmm. and this is where I talk about the five M's. So mm -hmm. what is it that you've really got to look at? So the five M's are your minerals, your microbes, your management, your organic matter, or your mindset. And mm -hmm. looking at those five different aspects and going, well, which one is it that's that's causing the drag in the system because on some properties all you need is biology mm. on another property all you might need is minerals or you might need a trace element to kick start that biology and off you go or you've got those two things working but your management is terrible mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. that's where you need to look and so um i'm not in any of those one camps i think you every situation is different and it's easy for people to build those assumptions if they're not traveling a lot and seeing well actually that is only a truth in this ecotype because there uh -huh. are some environments where that is true that is mm -hmm. so true yeah well the, some of those soils have all those nutrients locked up in them and they just need released but then right. there's other soils which are very deficient in certain things yeah yeah and sometimes all it is is a bit of trace element for mm -hmm. that microbial system to keep to get 
functional and then they can mine and release a lot of phosphate. Like you'll find um, there's very few environments in the world where phosphate is absolutely um, nil and zero. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is even in some of the, the, um, the places that are, you know, world famous for not having any phosphate. So say the Cape of South Africa or um, Western Australia, which, um, you know, is not meant to have any phosphate. We are seeing farmers there operating and farming very well um, without any phosphate issues, without using any phosphate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and have been doing that for a long time. So just using biology. So um, it's always to look at, well, what, what is the situation here? And what I see a lot of is people are missing um, key trace elements, particularly boron, mm -hmm. um, seem to find a lot of that. And boron's role in the plant is to translocate and move sugars around. So if it's not functional, then it's not going to be working with the plant in terms of helping it pump mm -hmm. sugars out to the biology. And then nothing works because it's, it's, the, it's the plant communicating with the microbes that build soil mm -hmm. and does all of that. So um, if we don't have that trace element, nothing's going to go that well. And, and mm -hmm. I've, I've been on operations that are doing a great job and are not building soil because they didn't have any borum. Mm -hmm. And that's actually some theme my soil test showed I'm deficient in. So I will, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get right on that. <laughs> yeah. And, when, and a good source for boron is actually chicken manure. If you can get, okay. um, yeah, for some reason, chickens eat stuff and then poop boron. They're like these alchemists. Okay. <laughs> Who knows well, why I they guess. do what they do. I have access yeah. to that. So I guess, I guess I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, fulvic and humic acid. I know mm -hmm. that's something that, and again, I feel like I've been reading soil books for years, but mm -hmm. I just was introduced to those two things really like a year or two years ago. And so mm -hmm. I feel like a baby in all of this sometimes, but uh, talk to me about the roles there and why you, why those are so important. Yeah. So the, what, I mean, why I quite like them is that they're easy to use. Um, they are a waste product. So they come from soft brown coals. Um, so they're not necessarily being mined for these um, humic type products. You okay. can also make a fulvic or a humic acid off um uh, vermicast or worm okay. extracts um, or compost. So you can make, I used to sell a certified organic humic acid that was from worm, worm. Okay. Vermicast. Um, and so what you're looking at really is the fractions of an organic substance. So if you think soft brown coal, we're talking about 65 million year old dead dinosaurs, mm -hmm. plants, all of that stuff. Now what's also in that material that just sort of takes it to the next level is it's full of what we call the quorum signals. So the, um, these are the biological metabolites um, from different types of bacteria and fungi as they're breaking down stuff and they're communicating to each other. They're releasing these signals. So we take this product that's 65 million years old that still has these signaling proteins in it and we mm -hmm. find plants respond to it really well. Um, and it also has an impact in terms of the plant opens itself to it. Um, so the research in humic acid shows that cell wall permeability, so how well something can enter a plant, increases by 30% with the addition of these humic acids. So mm -hmm. it means we can increase our um, efficacy of the products we're using or the trace elements or your nitrogen by adding in some of these carbon sources and the plants recognize it as food and they, um, they recognize it as metabolites. And so we see um, massive increases in efficacy um, by adding them. And so generally I think of um, as a general rule, fulvic for foliars and mm -hmm. humic for humus. So I'm using humic products um, on the soil and fulvics as foliars. So if I'm doing, um, yeah, trace elements or yeah, anything like that, I'm going to use a fulvic. Mm -hmm. So you also said it works for when you're applying herbicides. And now obviously mm -hmm. we don't want to do that many of those, but you said that that will actually increase the efficacy of that too. That's right. So, you know, I'd say the average size of operation that we work with is probably about 10,000 acres. Mm -hmm. And so um, many of them are using a lot of herbicides and um, it becomes one tool where we can go, well, at least in year one to three, we can be decreasing our use of um, herbicides by 30%. So that's mm -hmm. something that saves the money. Um, it helps by the biology will actually 
get in there and feed on then that that herbicide so we're testing soils and not seeing it showing up in the soil not seeing it showing up in the plant um, so there's some really interesting dynamics when we add those humic acids now mm -hmm. i don't want it to be a license to be like woohoo well we could just yeah. use all the chemicals we want but certainly in transition and what we find is as we start to build soil health um, we need less and less and less of those chemicals so guys are down to probably um, dropping that rate down to 70% in terms of the amount of herbicide that they're applying. So for me, that's, that's an awesome, mm -hmm. an awesome start. Um, it's a step in the right direction. It is, you know, like if you think about a lot of the techniques that are being put forth as, as other options, you know, to crimp a crop or do something like that, it's just not viable if you have 45,000 acres, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like, how are you going to do, you know, wheat and, yeah, all those other crops like that. And I guess people could argue, well, that's industrial agriculture and we don't want that to happen at all. But um, while we're dealing with reality, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do we help? Yeah. People still need to eat. But, you know, how, how do we do that on a large scale? And, um, and that's always been my fascination. You know, it's um, working with the large scale operators in terms of how do we get the chemicals out of the system? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that fascinates me. Just the, yeah. the massive scale. Yeah. So something also you talk about too, and I don't think you could directly address it, but the hydroponic movement, um, mm -hmm. which I think also has deep connections to what I call the shallow, well, everyone calls the shallow organics. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a soil person. So yeah, hydroponics has never been my cup of tea. Um, I also don't, I don't believe that we can get the same nutrient density and the same, um, the same quality from hydroponics without having your microbial partners and you know people are in hydroponics putting in some of these biological mm. additives but they might be putting in like six species or something compared to um you know millions of species mm -hmm. billions of species um and yeah and you think well that biology is providing materials that we don't even under fully understand yet you know the secondary metabolites the vitamins the enzymes the hormones mm -hmm. that are what gives us life giving food you know and i think the whole argument of you know we need the, these big stacked indoor um, energy inefficient systems to grow food for the planet i think this covid has really revealed how we don't have a food production issue we have a food distribution issue um, we don't need to all be growing indoors and the fact that here in america you can be hydroponic and organic i just uh, it's mind-blowing it's it's absolutely mind-blowing and it just shows really good lobbying by the hydroponic people mm -hmm. i mean um i think uh, most organic standards have soil as the foundation of, of what they're doing so i really can't understand how you can be hydroponic and organic mm -hmm. um but anyway, it, again, it is that shallow organic as opposed to deep regenerative organic thinking. Mm -hmm. Of the soil mm. first. Soil first. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about prospect farms. And you talk about how they're able to farm in such a brittle environment and produce way more than neighboring farms. What were the steps that they took to success? Yeah, so prospect farm is in Western Australia, um, Di and Ian Haggerty. I think they are up to 45,000 acres now that they are um, managing and they, they're growing, you know, just your small grain crops, very brittle environment. So yeah, typically, um, well, I think the average rainfall might be eight inches, but I don't think they've had an average rainfall for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily that they're producing way more than neighboring farms. Um, they probably produce equivalent but okay. what they see is when um, there's a lot of stress uh, or they're having frost events that they are not hit in the same way that the neighbors are, um, that they have a resilience system mm -hmm. so that they can produce even in a really poor year, they're still, they're still growing a crop. Um, they are pretty ruthless in their approach in terms of what they do. They just pull the plug. They just, um, you know, they're, they're taking on a lot of degraded um, chemically, melt just abused land and their whole program is orientated around these quorum signals so using worm extracts and compost extracts and that's it no fungicides mm. no pesticides um, minimal herbicides so they still are using um, some mm -hmm. um, 
and that's it. You know, they're not using trace elements and using any minerals. And so the, the plants kind of do it hard for the first couple of years as, yeah. they, as they go from having a system that was pretty high input to, to nil inputs. But they've been doing that for, um, when did they start? I, I can't think. It might be around 15 years. Um, I should know that. Anyway, yeah, so um, <laughs> they, they because they've got such a large area that they're managing, um, they can prop up mm -hmm. those new blocks as they come in because within, you know, three years, they are now back in the program and they've got, um, yeah, a biological system that's functioning very well. Um, mm -hmm. And really out there, it's biology that was, that was missing. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of their five M's, where to, where to look, it's, it's getting um, biological stimulants out there. And there's a lot of mineral, especially in, the, in these brittle um, environments, there's actually a lot of mineral that's just sitting there that's just been sitting there forever. That's just not been plant available. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So once you get that biology working, even though it's a very brittle environment, it's just being able to uptake those nutrients that were sitting there waiting to be utilized. Yeah. Yeah, and so they're measuring, um, you know, like their grain is a lot heavier. They have no residue, so there's no chemicals in their in their food. Um, mm -hmm. The digestibility of their grain is improved. Um, uh, apparently, it's it's great grain for making bread and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, and and I suspect people that have um, you know wheat intolerances potentially could eat grain like that because it's not full of, you know, herbicides and Mm -hmm. seconds and, and all the rest of it yeah so yeah i think that they're doing a fascinating job so that's prospect farm it's really worth looking up there um soils for life which is a big australian project's done quite a bit of work on them and um yeah you can just google them and have a look at what they're doing because it, it's it's impressive yeah and you talk about them in the book too what chapter again are they mentioned in the book chapter six let okay. there be light i think yes all right so yeah make sure you grab the book check it out yeah um, with that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with Nicole. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. All right, guys, we are back with Nicole Masters. And Nicole, let's you know use actually some current stuff that I'm working on right now, use myself mm -hmm. as an example. So we're mm -hmm. currently looking at a property that's had conventional corn on it and soy for the last 60 plus years. So right now it's just corn stubble. What would you, if you were to try to bring it back into production, what would be the fastest way to do so? Mm. I would first of all want to just do a little bit of benchmarking and look at mm -hmm. what what is the situation that you're dealing with. So you know, do your soil uh, mineral test and also do some um, multi residue testing. It can be amazing what chemicals can be stuck in there, especially if people have been no till for a long time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as we see a huge amount of build up. And if um, we talked about the value of those humic substances, um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't come into a program like that without using those humic substances because we've seen a lot of um, chemical being flushed that might mm -hmm. be, you know, used, mm -hmm. you know, five or six years ago. Um, we've seen atrazine coming through into crops. It's just sitting there. So oh, I'd wow. want to get some testing done like that, or just at least know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah, I, I certainly think a reboot with, with diversity, um, if this is just typical soy or soy corn, you know, and bringing mm -hmm. in livestock and, and just bringing in life, really, mm -hmm. um, you know, so animals. 
Yeah. So if you can't bring in animals onto the property, would you then just try to bring in um, like a different mycorrhizae mix or just a, a bacterial mix uh, and just like drip that on with some of the humic acid? I probably use worm extracts. So I'm not okay. second guessing what kind of biology. So yeah, the worm extracts is kind of my go-to place um, because there's so much diversity in that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think every, every property could have livestock. Maybe it needs ducks. Chicken, yes. You know, guinea Oops. pigs. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah, not that Americans eat guinea pigs, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why not, but <laughs> Yeah, they look so tasty. No. <laughs> um the other thing you recommend too is that, you know, deep ripping to kind of break up the compaction. But one thing you mentioned mm. is always be dribbling down some acids while you're doing that in the furrows. Yeah, so well, humic acids or biological foods. So anytime mm -hmm. you're out there with any kind of equipment, you need to be thinking, how do I feed my underground livestock? If I'm going, and I wouldn't recommend ripping unless you really had a major um, okay. plow pan or hard pan that um, is a, and I've even seen with this with cover crops where they just won't break through those pans at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe it's a once off thing that you do, but what, while you're doing that, you're going to drip just a small amount of, so it could be a bit of molasses and a bit of humic acid, mm -hmm. um, a bit of seaweed or something like that. And when I talk a bit, I'm talking like one or two pints. So we're talking tiny amounts okay. per acre just to start encouraging um, the roots and the biology to get down there. Otherwise what people find is they mechanically open up a soil and then it just closes again. Um, mm. Yeah. So we need to, to really encourage life to get down there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then would you come in with like a multi-species cover crop to kind of just um, start to you know, build that life as well? Yeah. Yeah. So probably like an annual multi-species in the first year and then the um, depends, you know, if you're going to go into vegetable production, then you might just want a couple of annuals. Um, mm -hmm. I love sunflowers. I'm so excited about what sunflowers oh do. Yeah. Oh. So last year we had a couple acres we brought in um, and we did sunflowers on them. And one, obviously the entire town came out to see them and take pictures, <laughs> which was <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. But two, it just, you know, the soil life was just amazing. Um, oh. And we did uh, cow peas underneath them. And by the end, the cow peas were just winding their way right up the sunflower stalks. Oh, so cool. Yeah. Another one that I've, I've always seen and I've always grown in, in the garden is phacelia. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've played with phacelia, but I mean, we I did. Yeah. We I, just, I, I don't think we had enough per acre because I found some, oh. but I, I just, I needed to get more poundage per acre in there to really get it coming up. Yeah. So I've been on operations that are actually feeding feeding lambs on it and okay. um, I, I'd never I'd always just thought of it as a pollinator species but you know it does some pretty neat stuff in terms of mycorrhizae and it's got pretty cool rooting systems and uh -huh. and it's just so pretty so yeah, uh -huh. I've, I've, yeah. I'm, I'm newly excited about Facelia. <laughs> very cool I'll make sure to add mm. that in mm. so another thing um I just got another soil test back that had super high mag so like 25 mm -hmm. percent but my mm -hmm. sulfur and my calcium were, my sulfur was already over what it should be. And my calcium was at the right level. Yeah. Would you just keep adding more calcium? Would I keep adding more calcium? Um, try to push the magnesium back down. Uh, calcium by itself isn't necessarily going to push your mag right down. I mean, that's sulfur itself will um, off gas. Mm -hmm. too. I mean, one of the things I like is to actually just put like a prill gypsum down the drill and then you're not putting a lot on. So you're not going to really whack off your, um, whack up the sulfur. The sulfur is really high, but we're talking like 30, 40 pounds an acre down the drill okay. will actually help to open up and flocculate. And because a lot of these high mag soils are often big cation, you know, big mm -hmm. The big cation exchange soil, so that means they're like big clay, heavier soils, often mm -hmm. have a lot of mag in them. Mm -hmm. um, and so to try and address that, magnesium becomes cost prohibitive. Um, and so by actually just putting a tiny bit down the drill, we find that we can then just influence that plant zone. Mm -hmm. So then that mm -hmm. plant itself can work away and change and open up that soil. Um, and I've been looking at, 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 at plant tissue tests as well. Like I don't look at soils in isolation mm -hmm. because just because um, you're saying sulfur is high and high mag and then you look at the plant tissue test and you'll find probably magnesium is low in the plant and sulfur might even be low. Um, uh -huh. And so I, I don't just look at it in, in, 
in isolation. But yeah, you've got to go, well, is that magnesium causing those soils to be really tight and sticky or hard? Because that's what high magnesium will do. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. then, then I would get into the, I'd get into that prill gypsum. And there is a, there is a liquid gypsum. Um, okay. Which is kind of neat to use. And you don't need a lot of that. I think you use like half a gallon. Um, okay. Yeah. That's not much at all. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be a, probably a cheaper way to... Yeah, yeah, a lot cheaper. Yeah, yeah, but 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 the focus really is on not trying to make the perfect numbers and not trying to influence the whole system, but how do I support the plant so that it can do its job? So if I'm drilling something, how do I just enable that plant to get the best start and and mm -hmm. really take off? And then then it will be the one that changes the numbers in the soil. It will be the one that actually changes what's happening with magnesium and all the rest of it. So um, mm -hmm. that's kind of our focus is more on that. How do you support the plant? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. Um, we mentioned this a bit earlier about water and infiltration. That is mm -hmm. also incredibly important too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh Especially yeah. in the crazy weather we've had in the last, you know, I think it's oh. more and more increasing every single year, yes. it feels like. It is. We are seeing um, more extreme events. You're going to get heavier rainfall and then dry periods. So having soils that infiltrate water is essential. And most people are absolutely shocked when they do an infiltration test. So they're really easy to do. All you need is like a piece of six inch PVC pipe, uh -huh. make it like, you know, four inches long six inches wide bang it in the ground and pour in an inch of water and time it and then pour in a second inch of water and time it and if you've got the patience see how much water your soil absorbs in an hour mm. and what we're finding on a lot of properties is they're not even absorbing an inch in an hour which is really <sighs> concerning it's really yeah. concerning um and so some of these soils are hydrophobic, which literally means they're afraid of water, which is like, okay, now you've got some problems if your soil's afraid of water. Yeah. Um, but some of the ranches or operations I work on, you know, they're infiltrating 18 to 20 inches of water in an hour. And then you go, why are we, why are we concerned that we've got these flash floods? Because you've had six inches of rain. Mm -hmm. You should be able to absorb that. Mm -hmm. But we mm -hmm. don't because we have these water repellent soils that, mm -hmm. that are that they're tight or you know whatever and so yeah um people need to get really curious about what's happening with water you know are you part of the solution or the or part of the problem and i i talk about twin rivers um in in the book which is just this remarkable hutterite colony that i work with and they just had a um sort of five and a hint five and a half inch rainfall event overnight and we drove around the district and their property is like 27 kilometers long so like 20 miles long wow and everywhere we went their drains are dry and all the neighbors were flooding and running fast and all their wow. drains were dry and we yeah. could walk out in their fields and you could dig a hole and you walk into the neighbors and you're walking into mud and sitting water and just you know like mm -hmm. The difference was so striking and so exciting and and you know those ranches are like they're really getting if uh -huh. you can get water in the system we now got a resilience instead of having all this water rushing off and you know and uh -huh. then it takes sediment with it and then it's going to go down to i don't know chesapeake bay or the uh -huh. mississippi and yep just cause chaos yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean we're on the miami river here and that feeds into the ohio which is basically into the mississippi yeah and it's you know every single rain we walk out and look at the river and it, it's it's a it's flooding our valley a bit and mm. it's just dirty dirty brown and you yeah. just i just can't I, I just can't fathom the the amount of soil that's just leaving our our, our, our state no, I was just in um, in Iowa recently at, doing a talk and they were calculating some of those fields are losing 100 tons of topsoil per acre per year. Oh my gosh. When we talk about shivers, it's like, what are you doing? So, you yeah. know, America's biggest export continues to be soil. You guys are losing just billions of tons of soil and, and it's an absolute travesty um, mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to happen. You know, mm -hmm. it's... So this um, Hutterite Ranch, was that just pasture or were they also doing crops? So yeah, there are about 23,000 acres of crops and then about 8,000 acres of cattle. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Very pasture. interesting. And then yep. like a no-till system or? Yep, no-till. Um, yeah, doing a range of small grains and, you know, they were doing some canola and, um, yeah, and, and doing about 1,000 acres a year of cover crop as well. So Okay. You know, putting the cover crops in uh -huh. um, yeah and having some 
you know, some great successes and some mixed successes when they weren't getting the rainfall for cover uh-huh. crops. Um, and so it was really interesting to see, um, you know, like if you're in a low rainfall zone, cover crops might not be the answer for you. And, and a lot of people are reaching to the cover crop like a silver bullet. And uh-huh. it's like, well, you know, is, is it, is it going to go well? I was just talking to a guy um, in the bottom of Colorado who their cover crops failed because they got too wet, mm. you know, and it, it's like, he's just a little small vegetable grower and he spent a thousand dollars, you know, putting in this cover crop that then didn't grow. And it's like, yeah. We can't, we can't treat this stuff like a silver bullet. And that's where I would, you know, I would put other things down the drill so that at least something's going to be helping you work towards your goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So CEC, that's something I think a lot of people see in a soil test and aren't quite sure how to deal with. Um, mm-hmm. Talk about a little bit about the importance of that. Yeah, so your cation exchange capacity is a measurement of your bank account in your soil, basically. Like what size bank account do you have? Do you have this huge big bank vault, um, which might be a CEC of over 30? Or do Uh you have like a teeny tiny little piggy bank, which might be a CEC of below five? And so um, below five would be telling you you've got a pure sand pretty much. I've actually actually got a client in Australia who's got a CEC of zero. Oh my Um, God. (laughs) Um, and and you're not allowed to call it sand. They call it a silver loam. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, it's white beach sand. Anyway, um, yeah. yeah. So CEC is a little bit like what your mama gave you when you when you take on a property. You know, is it something that is very heavy? Does it have a lot of clay? Um, what will also increase the CEC or the ability to hold on to nutrients and water is having more carbon, so more organic matter. Mm-hmm. So if you have like a very sandy soil. You know, every you know, all gardeners know this that we can Im- increase that water holding and nutrient holding capacity through organic matter or compost or whatever. Um, but again, this is part of you know we're talking about the plants pumping these exudates that will really help to 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 shift that CEC if you have mm-hmm. a low one. Um, yeah, so carbon's kind of the elixir for a lot of things. You know, will actually help a heavy soil as well um, in terms of opening it up and flocculating getting it mm-hmm. to breathe. Um, yeah. Do you see people using biochar? Because I hear mixed results on that. Um, well, the thing with biochar is that biochar can be made from so many different things um, mm-hmm. and could be charged up with a whole lot of different types of biologicals. So you are going to get a range of results. I heard of an operation that was making biochar from tires. Oh my gosh. Um, I know. So <laughs> you want to be really <laughs> careful about you know, I think um, it's a lot like the municipal compost production. Who mm-hmm. are they making that product for? Are they making a biochar for um, energy generation with a waste product that might not actually be suitable for agriculture? So you just got to be really careful um, mm-hmm. about it um, and just, you know, ask those questions and then um, make sure you are mixing it with something like compost. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, just because it's very, very acidic um, and, yeah, won't have a living component and it can be hydrophobic. Um, yeah. So, so it, it's important it, to get life with it is what you're saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And, and, and the people that are doing biochar for agriculture should be providing that, but they're not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, let's talk a little bit about worms. You talked at the beginning how you did some production yourself. Um, yeah. Do you think that most farms should have a worm production like – in theirs or just, you know, picking up the, the, the vermo castings or the, hum- the acids from uh, people that are doing that? Mm. Um, yeah, I think unless you're in a semi-arid arid environment, you should have worms. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and, you know, we come across this question when I'm working up in Canada uh, because a lot of Canadian worms became extinct with the glaciation you know, and the mm-hmm. glaciers have retreated, but the worms haven't necessarily followed it. So some people think of the worms up there as a pest. Uh-huh. Um, but it's more that we're seeing ecological dynamics change and humans don't like seeing stuff change unless they did it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we're seeing these invasive worms, which are changing forest dynamics. And, you know, it's it's just part of what's going to happen with nature because worms are going to move back into those environments over time. It's just been slower. So you're saying those worms aren't necessarily a bad thing. They're just different. 
they're just different yeah and so some of them are different species i mean a lot of what we see actually are um european worms <laughs> which is quite funny um yeah and so yeah they are changing um they will change forest dynamics because some of them are eating seeds they're eating the leaf duff and stuff under the forest so we will see actual forest um yeah the forests at the moment everywhere globally are going through some pretty big changes so i don't think it's just worms mm -hmm. um there's a lot of stress in um, trees because we've lost, if you think potentially we've lost 75% of insects, maybe, I mean, that's debatable, but um, we've also lost um, birds and <laughs> bears and fish and like all of that nutrient cycling that would happen in a natural environment is stopped. So we're seeing a lot of um, forest ecosystems under a lot of stress because they don't have the phosphate deposits that they used to get from all the guano or you think of like mm -hmm. bears i mean bears actually do poop in the woods yes. you know that yeah they're bringing up all that salmon and the oils and all that loveliness for trees um and in new zealand like it's really dramatic because we had so many seabirds and burrowing birds that are all extinct and so mm -hmm. we're seeing forest ecosystems collapse but something new will come through i mean and i think because we see everything in our short little human lifespans we panic and we we get depressed about it or whatever it's um i mean you see the pine beetle what's happening with mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um and i've ridden through some of those places and they, <laughs> it's quite horrifying um but it's just you know forests will reach a new equilibrium and and species that can do well with low nutrient inputs will start to come through mm -hmm. um you know and i think the people freaking out about worms and stuff is, is just part of that cycle is just mm -hmm. the new normal um, the, and the new, the new natives. I mean, and, and everywhere humans have gone, we've always disrupted ecosystems and brought new things with us. Mm -hmm. Well, I yeah. think back to like the passenger pigeon. I mean, you hear the stories about that and just mm. think about the incredible amount of nutrients that they were oh. cycling. Yeah. I think all that nitrogen, all that phosphorus, mm -hmm. just, yeah billions of tons that's no longer happening anymore yeah. Uh -huh. yeah so that's why you really want to look at your system and go how do i get more diversity in here how do i create a haven for birds and insects and all of it because they are bringing your nutrients and you know like insects themselves are the nitrogen thieves in an environment and and I talk about it in the book in terms of, you know, a plant might have four percent nitrogen but an insect has 16 percent uh -huh. and they die in 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 your environment and so um in forest ecosystems insects and their poop and their dead bodies contribute 90 percent of the nitrogen that you see in the forest uh -huh. which is just mind-boggling oh yeah yeah and you think well if i've got all these pollinator plants and if i've got spiders just going crazy and i have all of this life the amount of nutrient cycling that's happening um is phenomenal Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you have a whole chapter on weeds and i don't think we have time to get into it today but mm. Let's talk about the Canadian thistle, because I know that's a weed that gets a, a very bad rap all the time, but yeah. I, it's not as bad as we think, I think, most of the time. Well, again, it's an indicator, and it's, it's telling you something about that ecosystem, and, and this is why it's important to dig up the roots of your weeds and have a look at what, what is that trying to do, you know, and mm -hmm. Canadian thistle, um, you know, has a rhizominous growth, it um, has deep penetrating roots as well as horizontal roots um, and you'll find that those horizontal roots will chase layers of compaction so where you have um, tight zones go and have mm -hmm. a look and you'll see those roots follow that tight zone and what it's trying to do is trying to flocculate and open up a soil and there's actually an anaerobic bacteria that it has a relationship with so it will only do well if it has these anaerobic pockets so okay. if you if you create that compaction and those tight zones and anaerobic pockets, you, you know, the thistles are going to go, Oh, thank you very much. And so all weeds are responding to some kind of germination signal. And so in the book, I talk about the six factors that will lead to the signaling for a weed to germinate. So, um, it's not just that there's a weed seed bank in there and you're automatically going to have these plants growing. It's that they received a signal. So for the thistles, um, they, they get a bacterial signal, an anaerobic signal to germinate. Um, mm. and, and so, yeah, if we start seeing them encroaching, you want to get really interested about what's happening. They're also telling you something about calcium, mm -hmm. um, potentially high potassium. Um, 
Yeah, and so I'm I'm not really yeah too concerned about I I mean I'm not concerned about weeds at all. I get really excited about them, but um, yeah, and that yeah. field has high potassium, so that's one of the reasons yeah. Right there. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. so it, it could be a mineral issue, could be a microbial issue, could be that tight compacted problem. Yeah. 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 Um, let's talk a little about new farmers. I know you work with a lot of existing large farmers, but what do you think the biggest mistake beginning farmers make is? Um, being a little gung ho, I think, you know, and um, getting excited about something and leaping in all boots um, without, you know, it takes time to get to know your land. And I think, sometimes just being with land and, and starting to observe, you know, what is that prevailing wind? What are, when do I have these frosts? What are these conditions? Wet, this soil gets really wet now or, or whatever, because, you know, I see people planting plants that are not the right plants for that environment. Um, so I think um, probably one of the best things a, a beginning farmer can do is find a mentor, find someone in their local uh -huh. area. And a lot of people are really happy to help newbies. Um, and just, you know, take their advice and know that, yeah, you want to be, you know, you want to do everything, you know, and you want to do chickens and pigs and guinea pigs. Um, and you'll work out there's probably some of those things you're very good at and some you're not so good at and, and, I think it's important not to have any animal welfare in your learning processes. Um, but I think it is just that leaping in and maybe spending a lot of money on infrastructure um, when maybe it would be helpful to have another set of eyes. Um, and even, you know, you might not find locals who are regenerative or doing permaculture or whatever you're interested in. So trying to find someone that's relatively nearby um, or, or can give you some good advice. And I think, um, for me, uh, when I set up the worm farm business, I just had the I just had someone who came out and spent a day with me and gave me the best advice possible. Uh -huh. So I I just never had any problems, and I and you know I've worked with you know household worm bin systems and seen how people can just really screw things up. And I'm uh -huh. like I just uh -huh. never had I never had to learn the hard way because I went and found someone who'd already done all that learning, and I could just go okay I'm I'm going to walk in their footsteps until I figure out my own system. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, uh -huh. I think there is a tendency to get really excited, like you do, especially if you've wanted land your whole life and and uh -huh. now you have it, and you're like yay I'm gonna you know farm llamas or something and. Um, yeah, then figure out actually you don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's, you know, what you said right there is incredible. You know, we're thinking of a new enterprise and, um, you know, one of the first things I'm working on right now is finding the top people in the country that are doing that. Yeah. Um, because I want to go pay them for a day and it's yeah. going to be probably a, a, a pretty big check, yeah. but I'm going to walk away being so much further down the road totally. than I would after five years of experimenting. That's right. And it would have cost you more in that five year of experimenting, you know. Um, I think that is the best investment you can make more than anything else. Yeah. Uh -huh. Nice one. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Let's talk. You mentioned this is another thing which I love to talk about is you mentioned farmer C in your book. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, talk, you talk about mindset. So, so share with us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I find. Um, you know, people are concerned, you know, they've got these animal health issues or they've got these weed issues. And, and generally what it comes back to is if you're not sure where to look, look at yourself first, mm -hmm. you know, and that can be the biggest and hardest thing for people to do. But mindset really is often the biggest limiting drag. And so I talk about this pharmacy because, um, oh, he was the most infuriating um, guy I've ever had to work with and uh, I spent the day with him and and he'd been trying regenerative biological approach for 10 years and he was like well that doesn't work and I'm like have you tried this oh no I've done that that doesn't work and this didn't work and that didn't work and mm -hmm. um, we went outside at about lunchtime and I said okay can you take me to where you've been doing these practices in the same place for three years oh mm -hmm. I've never done that Oh, okay. All right. So what were you looking to tell whether or not something was working? And all he was measuring was yield. Uh -huh. um, and I'm like, okay, well, yield, if you're not going to keep it up in the same place, isn't really a measure for success. Um, and so then finally, by the end of the day, he told me what his program was, which was a pre-emergent herbicide, um, um, 
a neonicotinoid fungicide seed treatment, uh, a post-emergent herbicide, six fungicides, atrazine to, to, to burn off at the end of the season. And he oh was putting gosh. biologicals on the seed and he's like, can I sell that as regenerative? And I'm like... <laughs> Oh, you cannot. And so by the end of the day, he's like, so what do you think my limiting factor is? And I said to him, uh, it's your attitude, mate. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, I never worked with him again. But I've, I've since heard and seen that actually he's doing a great job now. He actually needed someone to hold the mirror up and go, it's not the products. It's not this. He was so terrified of letting go of the side of the swimming pool, I guess you could say, like learning mm -hmm. how to doggy mm -hmm. paddle, that he wouldn't, his mindset was that he couldn't, he couldn't stop all those other inputs because he might get diseases or he, he might lose it to insects instead of, no, you've got to start swimming at some point and you've got to build your soil health so that you can actually swim. So you need to be doing things for longer than a couple of years. So having that flick in mindset has now positioned him to be, um, one of the leaders in his region. I mean, he's selling um, seeds now and doing all sorts of really cool, innovative stuff. Uh -huh. um, but he was being totally stopped by fear. Um, and fear is, is very common in, in agriculture. And I think fear is certainly peddled a lot by, you know, the agronomists and you know, uh -huh. the chemical suppliers and stuff is really keep people fearful so that they'll stay on the treadmill and buy the, you know, whatever uh -huh. you're peddling. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is incredibly sad. Yeah. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? A shovel, a spade. Shovel. Okay. Yeah. yeah. To be able to get um, down there and see the livestock and, and the soil. Yeah. And most people are not digging holes and not digging enough holes. You know, even before you buy a piece of land, go and dig some holes. Go and have a look at what you're about to buy. Uh, it's your biggest investment. And most people have no idea. And it could be sitting on top of something really bad. Mm -hmm. um, but I think using observations, like all of them, like smell and touch and even taste and like just um, really looking for what are those signs for, for health and vibrancy. And so, yeah, your shovel is going to be your number one tool. Um, and most people have never used it for anything except to dig holes for putting in a fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the book, you talk about how the future is now. Um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Do you feel like now is the best time to be farming? I think with COVID, actually, it is because um, people are getting really interested about where their food's coming from um, and mm -hmm. getting really interested in, I mean, all of my buddies that are doing CSAs and um, direct marketed beef and lamb and their sales are just going through the roof because people mm -hmm. are getting really interested about where your food's coming from. And meanwhile, we're seeing, you know, industrial agriculture really struggle because they can't get to market um, mm -hmm. all the food that's being dumped and all the milk that's being dumped. So mm -hmm. I think actually um, people with the knowledge and experience um, that can teach others to farm as well, I think, um, we're getting back to that grassroots. And I, th I think for me, that's one of the positive outcomes that's going to come out of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think people hold like hope out in some kind of future space instead of actually it, uh, things are happening around us now and, uh, and are happening really, really quickly. So um, for me, it is about what is, what is happening now and seeing um, people's ability to be incredibly incredibly profitable and not need the massive tracts of land because they have diverse enterprises you know they might uh -huh. be doing honey and puppies and mushrooms and you know whatever lights your fire but you know getting clever about diversity um uh -huh. i've got i talked about um a friend of mine in the book who has um, a cordyceps mushroom that's uh -huh. um uh, uh, people are familiar with cordyceps they are uh, entomopathogenic so ento meaning insect pathogen meaning disease or actually the greek for it means literally suffering so insect suffering and it's a fungus that um invades into insects takes over their bodies and then grows these big mushroom bodies out of them well the actual mushroom has been used by the chinese for thousands of years for endurance and stamina and virility um and yeah apparently it does work very well um okay. and so he's found them growing all around his place and it's like it actually has the potential to make more money for him than all his cattle 
you know and, and so sometimes I just think we've got to be thinking outside the box and and you know these huge tracts of land and all that people run as cattle and it's like Mm -hmm. well what else could you do just to just to build resilience into your into your operation so you know even if it's selling seeds or or whatever but um i do think now is one of the best times um i don't know actually that's not true i don't know if it's one of the best times because we are going to see more um, volatility in terms of climate um Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the best time for us to be focusing on soil and mm -hmm. soil health because we are not going to be able to continue to produce food the way we have been um, mm -hmm. into an uncertain future. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the chemical age or the green revolution is coming to a close. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. We're seeing massive growth. I mean, we're seeing, I'm getting texts because we obviously work with a lot of vegetable growers and I know so many of them. And like one farm uh, set up a co-op and last week they did $100,000 through that co-op. In, in one week? In one week, yes. Wow. Yeah, he texted me. The first week was 30, then it was 50, then it was 70, and then it was 100. Yeah, bring so it on. It's, it is unbelievable. And yeah, it's the farmers who are set up to be year round that are really being able to crush it right now. Yeah. Um, but I believe this summer too. I mean, I think people, I think there will be an overarching wave. And I, one of the things I saw was, you know, all right, how are we going to keep these people? And I yeah. was like, yes, that is the question because if mm -hmm. you don't help them establish and then keep those new habits, they're yeah. just going to go right back to Walmart. That's right. But that's where I think we need to be producing top quality nutrient dense uh -huh. food because you eat, like we used to grow kale that was running a BRICS of 15. So BRICS uh -huh. is a measurement of photosynthesis. Most kale that you buy at the grocery store runs between one to three and it tastes bitter and it, well, it just tastes like crap basically. Uh -huh. yes. you, you produce kale or the BRICS of 15. It is sweet and flavorful and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know kale could be like this. Yes. If, if you can provide food like like that to people they're not going to go back to the mcdonald's style low nutrient dense like why mm -hmm. would you mm -hmm. and i think you yeah. know providing excellent customer service making it easy for them so that they're not having to go round and round and round and i think some of the depots with the csas and you know just just trying to make it a bit easier for people because that is the attraction of walmart obviously well, yes, yes, is that you get exactly what you want and you get it quickly. And so I think the, yeah, the old style CSA where you just get a box every single week, I think the millennia culture is not going to, there's only a very small portion of those, um, the hipster, hipster people, which yeah. are okay with that. Uh, yes, me and my wife, yeah, we could totally deal with that because our background is that and we just love vegetables. But yeah. people, they want to pick what they're going to eat. They, a kohlrabi is scary to them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, being able to have that convenience and what they want is going to be so important. You know, it's interesting you brought up kale because just the other day, um, I had my little three-year-old Simon out and uh, he actually went to the kale patch. He picked himself a leaf and stuffed it in his mouth and was eating it. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's mind blowing that you gotta, yeah. you know, because that normally would be so bitter that they'd just be spitting it out and like, oh, this is nasty. Yeah. Um, I'll have to send you that picture. It's kind of cute. Yeah, yeah, send me the picture. Yeah. Yeah, my son used to do that. I'd watch him walk to the school bus and grab kale and I'd be like, That is not normal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, how how we can just delight the senses with, with something like that. And I think um, you know, seeing the emergence, I guess, of some of these food bags where they are providing like all the ingredients and they give you their menu and whatever. I mean, you could provide a kohlrabi and with with the, you know this is how you yeah. cook it and this is mm -hmm. what it's like and i think most people like um oh what's what's it uh oh gosh jerusalem art not jerusalem oh yeah jerusalem artichokes and then the other artichokes um yeah yeah globe artichoke globe artichokes you know they have they, that is that is an eating experience but mm -hmm. most people would not know how to deal with that at all and um mm -hmm. it's uh it's being able to make it easy and make it fun yeah. and tasty providing those recipes yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's no going back. I mean, I, I love Jerusalem artichokes. I put them everywhere. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually had a pizza that had Jerusalem artichokes um, shaved and then like deep fried Ooh. on top of the pizza. It was incredible. Yeah, that would be good. That would yeah. be good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So where can people find out about more about you and your work? Um, yeah, so Integrity Soils. Um, the website we have information on that and then yeah I, I do seem to get around a bit so there's quite a lot of youtube videos and stuff yeah. um i've got an older ted talk that's out there on you know falling in love with soil um 
and yeah, I, I really recommend people grab a, a copy of my book. It is available um, on Kindle as well as a hard copy and there is um, Audible as well. So it's awesome. Yeah. 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 I find a lot of um, farmers and growers are listening to Audible these days um, mm -hmm. and it's in my New Zealand accent. So you'll be fluent by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nicole, we really appreciate you spending the time with us tonight. I know um, that you uh, yeah, interrupted your day to come on, so we appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, we wish you the best. And um, yeah, again, I really enjoyed the book. It was, uh, it was part of my 6 a.m. Reading, reading schedule for about yeah. two weeks, So I can't believe you said not another soil book. So I'm really, really, <laughs> really pleased that you enjoyed it. <laughs> Well, it's, it's one of those things. Every single soil book I read, I get a little bit more out of. But yeah. then again, it's, it's becoming such a big part of my library yes. because it's so, so, so important. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah. no, it's good yeah. stuff. And Absolutely. I still feel like a baby in the, uh, the whole, you know, interpreting soil tests, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah. You keep on learning, keep on learning. All right, well, Nicole, Brilliant. we'll let you go, but thanks yeah. again so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the chat. I really enjoyed it. All right, all the best, Michael. Thank you. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Next week, Dan Miller, who is the founder and CEO of Steward, the world's first crowd farming platform, will be joining me. So Steward enables people to invest directly in sustainable farms through them you know, managing the investment or through farmers just creating a profile and actually building a crowdfunding platform there as well. So super interesting and fascinating interview. Um, they've been around for a couple years now, so they've actually had some track record and, and we talked about that. And we just talked about Dan's philosophy on farm investments and how you should start funding your farm farm. So again, join me next week and listen to Dan talk all about funding your farm. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.